My name is Andrew Stotts, and I'll be your host as we continue our journey into the teachings of Dr. W. Edwards Deming. Today, I'm continuing my discussion with David P. Langford, who has devoted his life to applying Dr. Deming's philosophy to education, and he offers us his practical advice for implementation. Today, we continue our discussion of Dr. Deming's 14 items that he discusses in his New Economics book about the role of a manager of people after the transformation. This is on page 86 of the third edition or page 125 of the second edition. And this is point number nine. Let me read it to you before we get started. So again, for a the role of a manager of people, this is the role, new role of a manager of people after transformation. Point number nine, he will try to discover who, if anyone, is outside the system in need of special help. This can be accomplished with simple calculations if there be individual figures on production or on failures. Special help may be only simple rearrangement of work. It might be more complicated. He in need of special help is not in the bottom 5% of the distribution of others. He is clean outside that distribution. And Dr. Deming presents a, a normal distribution and some other things uh, in this chart that he presents in this one. And we're going to call this episode, Who Needs Special Help? David, take it away. Okay. Um, yeah, this is always a topic of discussion because um, there's all kinds of management theories out there, right? About uh, <clears throat> how we manage. I can't remember who uh, was a proponent of just getting rid of the bottom 10, 10% of Jack the organization Welch. every year. Jack Welch, yeah, notoriously wrong uh, with that. And, uh, or, you know, well, if you can't cut it, you know, out you go. And that that all sounds good until it becomes so expensive <laughs> to constantly be hiring new people and replacing people. And 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 the fear level goes up, up so high that, that you can't get anything done because no, nobody wants to take any risks because you really can't take a risk because you, you might be gone. So Deming's saying a lot really in this point. Um, he talks about the distribution of people. Well, so first thing is you have to figure out what is that distribution, <laughs> right? So how are you calculating that or, you know, how, how are you figuring out what that performance level is? Well, as a teacher in a classroom, Obviously, you know, you have tests that you're giving, you have projects that are happening, et cetera. It's actually pretty easy to see that distribution of performance in a classroom. Uh, you, you give a simple sum on something and then you look at the test results and you start to see, OK, everybody scored on this test from 70 to 100 percent on this test. Right. So <clears throat> you can say, OK, that's that's an average of about 85 or so for the whole class. When you look at it on a histogram scale like that, what Deming's really talking about, he's not talking about just the people that were scoring at the lower end of that distribution. You know, people that were getting 70, 75, 80, et cetera, those, they were all at the lower end of the distribution of that system. But what it's showing is that's the capability of the system. <laughs> you did something, you did a process with people, you tested the process, the process produced that curve, and on average, it gives you an average of 85. Now, deciding whether or not that's good is good, is good, good enough, that's a whole different really discussion than what really Deming's talking about here. So he's not talking about people just on the lower end of a distribution of performance. He's really talking about somebody that's completely outside of that distribution. So in a classroom, if if I did something like that and we did a project or test or whatever, and everybody's scoring from 70 to 100 percent, except for maybe two people that got 10 <laughs> or five, right? Obviously, these are two people completely outside of the system. And uh, what he's really talking about is probably no amount of adjusting the system is going to help those two people. 
Mm. They are so far outside of the distribution that they really do need special help. So in a classroom, that, that can mean this could be children with special needs. They could be hearing defects. They could be eye, the eyesight. I don't know how many times I thought somebody was an understanding problem. And then we find out, oh, they couldn't, they couldn't see. <laughs> Either they couldn't see to read or they couldn't see the, you know, Something the whiteboard in front of them. Yeah. And they got tested and got glasses and everything. And wow, it just made a huge difference. But obviously, when you have people in a special category, it's going to take much more time and effort individually to deal with them, right? And that's why it's called special, <laughs> mm. special need, right? Because you are going to take the time and effort individually to deal with those individuals. If you don't have anybody completely outside of the distribution of performance, then you're going to go back and look at the system itself. So in my example, everybody's scoring from seven, 70 to 100% on, on some tests that you give them, and the average is 85 then you have to so decide is good good enough you know is that a good enough distribution on this and as a teacher that a lot of that has to do with understanding where does this fit in the entire curriculum so is this a critical skill that if these students don't have this skill and they don't you know don't have it just down down pat and or acing it it's going to cause huge problems later on so it might be worth the time to go back and sort of rework that for the entire class and see if we can't get a higher average. On other things, you might look at that and say, oh, okay, um, only I know really the whole curriculum for the year. And I know that we're gonna be revisiting the same concept probably four more times throughout the year. So this average at this time of the year is probably good enough. Mm. So, yeah, you know, I often joke with teachers and say, you know, if you're happy with your average and you know it, clap your hands. So, <laughs> but if you're if you're not happy with your average and you know it, then you have to think about, okay, well, what am I going to do about it? Right? Do I have the time to go back and rework this? And uh, Dimming in his example uh, in Figure Twelve that he's showing there is actually talking about. Um, moving in the entire system forward. So shrinking shrinking the variation so that it's not nearly as wide as it used to be and more people are getting a higher average mm. within them. So, so how, how do you get that higher average? Well, uh, prevention is the key to quality. So every time you're doing a lesson that you've done before and you're taking that feedback that you've done, gotten before, folding that in, and, and this time when I did it, ah, wow, we got an average of 89 or we got an average of 93 or, <laughs> excuse me. It's, uh, it's really difficult when you're improving a system and you're moving that average uh, up um, each time you go through something, uh, when you start to get up and really high levels performance going from like 93 to 94 is a really big effort. I mean, mm. there's got to be something really happening there to get that next level result. And do you really have the time right now to get that? Or is it a, a problem of tomorrow that we have to figure out, okay, what are we going to do in this system? You know? in the future to get a higher average. But um, I didn't believe really this when I started working with Deming, but then I went back and looked at all the grades and scores that I'd given uh, people. And I was so predictable. <laughs> Every year I had the exact number, of same, uh, same number of people getting A's or doing top level work. I had the same level of percentage of kids that were failing. I had, but of course, it was always their fault, not my fault. So, mm. <laughs> right. And so that was really eye opening to me that that all I had been doing is just basically, you know, for five or six years, been doing the same thing over and over and over and expecting a different result. 
and it just doesn't just doesn't work like that. Yeah, I mean this uh, so, this one's this one's interesting because first of all, he's presenting us with a uh, uh, a distribution. We can see a normal distribution, and he's presenting also a more narrow distribution, saying that the goal is to try to maybe in this particular case that he's showing to he says you want to work to improve the system by narrowing that distribution so that and shifting it as we can see as we've talked about but i think in also in this one you know if you don't understand the system you could get caught up in chasing performance in uh individuals that actually are just a normal outcome and you miss the time that you need to spend to fix that special cause uh, that that needs to be fixed. So that that was one of the things I I took away from it. What what do you think about that? Yeah, that's why that's why he uh, hated practices like grading on a curve, which is notorious. It still is notorious in many universities of grading on a curve, and because that shows no understanding of of performance and distribution and and average performance it, it takes no accountability and uh for you as the teacher it just all blame on the student well if you tried hard you could do that well no that's not true <laughs> there's only going to be so many a's so many b's etc so you're not you're not going to ever get there so um, but just, really just, this just is about to, to understand when, that a little bit more uh so is the problem about grading on a curve that you're constantly you're like you're not necessarily improving? You're just like, well, this group had a curve that was here on the continuum, and this group had a little bit better. They were better. And what is it? You know, because I'd say grading on a curve is something that people it, initial on initial blush would think, isn't that what Deming's talking about? I mean, we see normal distributions, we see curves. Explain that in more detail. You're, you're creating an artificial scarcity of top marks. So only, no matter you, no matter how well we do as a class, there's only going to be so many top marks or people that are going to get the top grade, right? Mm. And so you're going to create all kinds of uh, competition and you're, you're going to create all kinds of weird behaviors that go on. You're, you're actually encouraging people to cheat. Um. I, I can't remember if I told you this story or not, but one of my children, uh, she was in a, a advanced chemistry class or something, I think it was. And she comes home the first day of school and she said, Dad, I think this uh, this teacher would be really interested in talking with you about, you know, what you do and, you know, improvement, and everything else. And I said, why? And he said, because he said, well, everybody in here can achieve. Everybody in here can get an A, can do well. She comes home the second day of school and she said, I think I'm going to drop this chemistry class. And I said, what happened in two days? We, she said, he came back today and he spent the whole hour of the class explaining how he grades on a curve. So there's no way in the world that everybody in here is going to get an A, right? Mm. You're creating an artificial scarcity of top marks and it's just not going to happen. And I, I said, okay, well, just let me know, you know, what you decide to do or with that. Well, she comes home the next day and she said, I, I think I'm going to stay in the class. I'm pretty sure I'm going to be one of the people on top of the curve and, you know, that. And this was an honors chemistry class. And in that class, half of the kids in that class had had straight A 4.0 averages to that point. So there was a bunch of kids that quit because they, they could not risk <laughs> getting even a, a B right. in a class like that. But my daughter stayed in the class. At the end of the first semester, she comes home laughing one day and she said, dad, you'll never guess what happened. I said, what? And he said, well, um, this is a very, very smart group of kids. And not only did kids keep track of their own scores, they actually kept track of other kids' scores in the class as well. And I think there were one or two kids that found out that there were a bunch of kids that were just right on the line between a B and a C or something. But if those kids failed, it wouldn't make any difference to them. They're still going to get the same grade at the end of the semester, right? Even if they didn't even take the final, mm -hmm. 
it's not going to affect them one way or the other. They're still going to get that B or C grade that was in that. But if they did fail, it would mean it would change the curve and these other top kids could move up into the top uh, <laughs> echelon. And so they paid these kids $20 to fail the final. Well, somehow the, the teacher found out about it and then the principal, principal found out about it. And then there was a Spanish Inqu Inquisition that was taking place. And, and then they were talking about expelling kids and all kinds of stuff. That I couldn't stand it. They had to go and talk to the principal and said, how do you like it? And he said, what do you mean? He said, you, they're better at, at managing your system than you. <laughs> they, they figured out how to play your game better than you. And you got you to be rewarding these kids, not <laughs> recognizing um, amazing statistical analysis and capability, not punishing them through that process. So uh, I think it was the same principle said, I know I'm having a bad day when your car's in the parking lot. So <laughs> exactly. You should have said you should have been you, you didn't realize you were teaching them a double major, AP chemistry and AP statistics. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, well, let's let's wrap this up by you know I think the key thing of what Dr. Deming's telling us in this is about um, understanding your system, and then identifying if someone is outside of the system, and that person or result outside of the system is you know warrants some special attention or special help, and that 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 you you can't really know that without understanding the system and also not being too distracted by the variation that's natural from that system. And therefore, ultimately, once you understand that, then you really can clearly identify that some outcome or some individual is a special cause. And then you can focus in on that and fix it. And so that that's how I would summarize it. Is there anything else you'd add to that? Yeah, I, I just was recalling that <clears throat> I heard Deming explain several times that if somebody is outside of the system, that far outside of the system, further rating and ranking are not going to help them at all, right? Giving them more failures, more Fs, docking their pay, whatever you're thinking of do doing to somebody that's completely outside the system, it's, it's really not going to help them at all mm. uh, in, in that process. And that that's not help <laughs> rating and ranking and and bribing people to do better is not is not actually helping them you actually have to study the cause or the reason why that person is a special cause and then do something about it uh in a classroom it could very well be that this person really doesn't belong in this class <laughs> they don't have the prerequisite skills that the other 98% of the class has. And so therefore they really don't even belong in this cl class. Mm. So that just means you have to get them in a different class or, or, or help them in some way to get caught up or, you know, and it's going to take more time and effort. Special causes take more time and effort. That's why they're special. So, mm. Mm. well, David, on behalf of everyone at the Deming Institute, I want to thank you again for this discussion. For listeners, remember to go to Deming.org to continue your journey. And you can also learn more about David at LangfordLearning.com. This is your host, Andrew Stotz, and I'll leave you with one of my favorite quotes from Dr. Deming. People are entitled to joy in work. Mm -hmm.